Hi guys, it's Alicia again. It's a great day that I decided not to volunteer for an extra shift at work. So Grace and God are taking the day off. I was doing some painting, working on a, like a landscape piece for Corban. And I'm reading this better than Nietzsche, Sex and the Single Girl by Helen Gurley Brown. She's a real one, her right here. That's actually me, believe it or not. It's crazy. They took that picture in black and white from me. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about today is kind of go into the habits that set me apart from other people. And what I mean by that is it's stemming from the foundational question of like, was I normal? And if I wasn't normal, like how not normal was I? So do I want to be facing the camera or facing away? Let's face the camera. So one of the things I remember quite distinctly is when I stopped is I used to constantly be mumbling prayers under my breath, like constantly talking to God, constantly asking specifically to be a woman. And also just like talking to God, like they mentioned prayer in church. They mentioned prayer was like, you're literally just having a conversation and with your heavenly father. And so just my parents were quite neglectful of me when I was growing up, um, especially in terms of emotional and psychological uh, support and connection, that sort of thing. Really lacking on all that kind of stuff. They, it wasn't, the emotional investment wasn't there in my early life, definitely not. Um, so I would just be constantly praying and I would constantly be talking to God. And then I remember we were watching MTV, like in our upstairs room on the second story of our home, uh, there in South Texas. I'm not sure if I'm going to say names specifically yet. And I guess we'll say that for the book or something. And we had a little TV up there, like an old, like VCR TV. This had to have been like 2002, 2003. Maybe even earlier, possibly later, like latest nine or ten, because I feel like most of my social development, just because we were such an isolated people, the fundamentalist Baptists. I mean, we went to Baptist school, we went to Baptist church, we did Baptist activities, we rarely had guests over, we didn't have like extended family come in us for a long time. It was very like private, very in house, uh, like the church in the broader community. Like my father was on the board of the church at one point. Father was a lawyer by trade. Uh, he had his own law office, and then my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, but for like the, major the majority of our early life, I don't really remember much of either of them. Honestly, we had a live-in housekeeper, Lonnie, and she was great. God willing, they paid her well because she lived in the house with us and was our maid. Like she cooked most of our meals. She was like the one that played with us. So I learned most of my like appropriate conversational Spanish, as opposed to in soccer, where I learned the other side of it. Um, she was awesome. I remember one great story with her was that we had the Muscovy ducks. We had a resaca outside. So a resaca, for people that didn't grow up in South Texas, a resaca is a piece of the, the river, the Rio Grande, that cut off. So it could have been like a tributary, it could have been just like part of the larger branch uh, before it got like reneged so much. And so it was usually like brown, pretty sluggish water. And like it would blow in the wind, but you know, it didn't have like a current. It didn't really have much as a body of water should. It didn't have a lot of alligator gar. It was murky and dirty. Yeah, but we did get a lot of ducks. There were fish in there. Like, I mean, the water was brown, like brown green, like something straight out of the Amazon is what I'm talking about. And I remember this one time it actually flooded. So we had a brick wall there in our backyard, pretty big backyard. Yeah, the red brick wall. And then you go down and you have like the little wooden edge of the property and like there's the water. Uh, but when it rains, we had terrible drainage. And so, and since the soil was so like clay and just sediment, it's just like really big sediment. So like you would, I remember you dig down in the dirt and it'd just be like just mud. Like you would just hit straight mud pretty immediately. And you're like, oh, I'm like in a swamp, essentially. Like if you go out to anything around, um, South Padre Island, like it's, it's just like marshland, it's like half marshland. Anyway, so we get Muscovy ducks. Muscovy ducks, uh, pretty big farm duck, honestly. It's like largely domesticated. Um, it's usually like solid color, like iridescent feathers, but they have like a fleshy face, you know, like a turkey. So they have flesh all over the face. I remember saying like, oh, those ducks are so ugly. 
as opposed to like the mallards because you know the mallards are just beautiful apparently they're like total bullies but we can probably get into that another time and and Wani's like no they're beautiful and I made a connection at that point it's like oh maybe she's talking about herself and I was like I get it I hear you like I remember like I heard that and Grace of God is just absorbed so now I'm pretty cool with my Scooby Duck but places like that conversations like that is largely where I made my most emotional and social development because I didn't have much opportunities interacting with people abroad and I say abroad because we used to go to Mexico just about every Sunday after church uh my grandpa, the patriarch of our family, basically, Grandpa Joe Zavaleta, amazing man. I love and respect him to this day. I mean, he's going to rest in peace. And we would go to this place called Garcia's in Matamoros. And Matamoros is like, I know, I'm going to not pretend that I know how to pronounce everything correctly. Uh, Matamoros is like 30 minutes south of the border, like once you pass the border wall. I remember looking out the like the Spanish little pavilion they had in the center town, like old red brick and cobblestone. Like you really felt you were in another country. Now it's the most amazing part. There's so much of the world America misses out on by having a bad relationship with Mexico. I can say that's totally true too. Like there's so much good in Mexico, and and there are amazing people that live through the bad just to get to that good, and that should tell you something. But as terms of like family conversations, especially on the dinner table when it comes to emotional and social development, largely intros it's like geocentric to your thinking. Like America's number one. Why? Because America's number one. It's God's chosen country. Why? The Baptists believe so. Number two, um, do we like any foreigners? Not really. Not really at all, honestly. Especially if they don't speak English. I mean, my father spoke Spanish, but he didn't teach any of us Spanish. We always thought that was kind of odd. Um, so, like, when the gardeners would come by, like, to mow the lawns and stuff like that, or do landscaping, uh, my mom would speak, like, broken Spanish as opposed to, like, full Spanish, like she could have, my father taught. But, like, any of us. We just had to, we just had, like, notes written down that we would hand off to them instead of learning how to talk. So Grace Scott translates now to, I try to learn at least one or two words in somebody's native language, like if I know them, just say, can you be like, oh, I made a connection. It's like a little spark. It's nice. Um, not to say that it's going to be successful every time. I've had so many instances where when I like, I try forcing conversation. I do really badly with the foreign languages. I've tried learning like Mandarin and Russian specifically, but I remember I I was at a, a temp job, like working some electrical thing or like store setup. That's what we're doing. We're doing store setup like midnight. Like it was, a, it was an overnight shift. It's me and this other dude. And it turns out the two electricians are Russian. So it's like this uncle, I'm assuming, teaching his nephew, like this young Russian dude, how to do electrical. They were talking Russian the whole time. And we were like, I was like, oh, this is fascinating. Like I knew that part of Washington where I was at had a Russian population, but I assumed they were farther east. So I was like pretty excited because I knew a couple of the Russian people in town. And then, oh my gosh, I, I asked like, what's his name? Or like, my name is, do I even remember? Oh my God. I hope I said muy rapotem vunieste. I really hope I said that because that would have been like actually a thing to say. Um, oh my gosh, how do you ask your name? Bajalusta? No, that's something, that's please. Oh my god. See, but Grace got, at the time, like, I asked correctly, but he kind of, like, chuckled, and I'm like, oh, fuck, I messed up, didn't I? I was like, dude, I'm sorry. Well, he spoke to me in English back, and I'm like, that's, he just tripped me up, like, at least... Like it's it's like totally fine. I there was just like a positive response in terms of like me trying to speak a foreign language to somebody. Um and so he's like, Oh, that's just like a really formal way of saying it. And I was like, Yeah, because I learned it off Babel. But all
all those intentions of like learning about the world and being multicultural and like understanding different people. I'm trying to make the roundabout point that that was always in my system. There were later points in my life where I was like vehemently in denial of it, like just a complete denial of everything that I was. Um, that would be that would be the early years of college. So that might be a couple of videos down the road where we talk about like my experiences and like about ultra far right, like stuff like that. Because of course my story's gonna have a bunch of twists and turns, but I'm gonna call it good on this one. Uh, thanks you guys for listening, and see y'all next time.